Good morning, Encounter Church. How are we? Good. That was a special time of worship. Amen? Maybe I'm just a sucker for the old songs. I don't know. But Last week we heard Jesus' uh, surprising commission to us to go home, to take seriously the prospect that hometown, that, 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 that where we are right now is a legitimate mission field, that we're here for a purpose, that God is equipping us, has, has sent us here. Even if we grew up here and our family grew up here five generations back, we are uniquely sent here. And that mission isn't always extravagant, but it always involves taking one small step of faithfulness. I encourage you last week to take baby steps, to be obedient to whatever God was calling you to do next in your own living room, in your own kitchen, whatever. There's a step in front of you, a step of faithfulness and discipleship. Just take that. That's what I encouraged you to do last week. Trusting that that is a a mission, that that matters. Trusting God to lead us where he will from there. And we all needed to hear that, I think. I think it was a pretty good sermon. (laughs) Right? No, 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 no. Shut it down right now. (laughs) Shut it down. Totally joking. Appreciate that. Was that Mike? You should should know better. Um, That being said, not a bad sermon. B, B+. We have to acknowledge this morning that there is a downside. There is an inherent danger in that commission that Jesus gives us. Uh, We have to acknowledge this morning that that, uh, the problem with staying home to do mission is that home is home. Home is comfortable, and it's very easy to get complacent. I mean, when you're out on the mission field, it's game time, right? You're somewhere totally new, totally foreign to you, and your mind the whole time is like, I'm not comfortable here. And you are very cognizant, very aware that I am on mission. But when you're home, what does your brain tell you? Let's kick the shoes off, right? And, and if we're honest with ourselves, we, maybe we even want to kind of keep mission out there and, and keep home as a place of comfort and leisure, right? That's a little bit what home is for. And we naturally feel ourselves relaxing when we're here. The good news is we're not alone. We're human. Uh, And actually, much of the biblical story is a story of people who tried and mostly failed to live out mission at home. And uh, I'm going to show you what I mean by doing a a quick five-minute flyover of the Old Testament. Does anyone have like a stopwatch? Anyone bring a stopwatch to church with them? All right, time me. Give me, fi- give me five minutes exactly, okay? Let's see if I can do this. From day one, God had a mission for his people. After God created the first two people, he told them, be fruitful and multiply, to which they said, I think we can do that, God. Yeah, uh, we'll get right on it. And then he said, fill the earth and govern it. Be my image bearers. Take, come alongside me, name these animals, tend the garden, You are going to do something. You are going to have a mission. And you are going to show what I'm like to the the animal kingdom, to the rest of the world. And this mission continues. Eventually, God calls a particular man, Abram, and he gives him this commission. He says, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Settle in this land, become a great nation, and when I have established you in Canaan, the surrounding nations are going to take notice. And because I, God, will be so obviously at work in your midst, they will take notice and they will give me glory as the one true God. They'll say there's something different about those folks. They're on to something. They know the true God. And through Israel's presence there, the rest of the world would come to know him or be cursed by cursing them, whatever it may be. Either way, these are God's people, a holy nation, a city on a hill. So after a time in Egypt, God leads Israel through this time of wandering and refinement and eventually to the promised land of Canaan. They've arrived, and this great military leader, Joshua, helps them conquer the land, and on his deathbed, he, he gives a challenge to the people of Israel, a challenge that most of us have hung on our, on our walls or, or some, to some degree, or you can buy it at Lifeway, this af- not this afternoon, Monday morning morning if you want to. And this says, choose today whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, 
We will serve the Lord. And the people say, huzzah, we will serve the Lord too. We will be totally committed. As soon as we get here and settled, we are going to crush it. And they're going to know you're the true God and we're going to be faithful. And then we quite literally turn the page to the book of Judges, chapter 2, and we read, After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. One generation. That's all it took. That's all it took to get settled in the land. And I say settled very intentionally. And they forget the Lord. They got in. They got comfortable. They forgot what they were there for. And they enter into this cycle that would repeat itself throughout the rest of the, of the Old Testament. And the cycle that happens is this. Is this would happen. The Israelites would get settled. They'd get complacent. An enemy would rise up against them, kill them, take their land, etc. And God would raise up a judge, which is like a general or a king, lead them, get their land back. They'd say, oh, God is so great. He gave us victory. They'd worship God again until the passage of time, and they get settled again and forget about God. Wash, rinse, repeat. That's, that's the whole Old Testament. You don't have to read it now. You're welcome. <laughs> Eventually, things get so bad in Israel that, that they're, they're decimated by Babylon, and, and, and they're carried off into exile they're taken away from their homes. Many of them are killed, and those that survive, they are taken to be slaves in Babylon for 50 or 70 years until that generation of people dies out. This is the, the low point of the history of Israel. And after living this time of exile, God brings them back in waves to their land. He raises up leaders to lead religious reform, to reestablish their temple that had been destroyed, and the people settle in the land of Canaan again. And by now, an alarm bell should go off in our head. Of, of, we know what's going to happen here, right? They're going to fall back into the cycle. They're going to fall back into sin. They're in the land again. They're going to get comfortable. But look, look what we find when we read Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, the leaders of the people, at the end of this long prayer of confession, they say, so now today, we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. This is really significant for understanding the biblical story. They were back in the land, but they were not free. They were under the thumb of the Persian Empire, and after that would be the Greeks and then the Romans. They had returned to Babylon, but they were still, in a sense, exiles. They still felt like we're not really home. Because there's these people over us. And they were not at home, so in their minds, they could not live out the mission that God had for them with these Romans ruling over them or whoever it may be. They were exiles in their own land. And they remained exiles until Jesus' day. They tried several times to overthrow Rome before and after Jesus. There were several attempts, several would-be messiahs that tried to overthrow Rome. They all failed, and they remained subjected. And as long as they did that, they felt... This isn't as it should be. We can't really be Israel. We can't really live out what we were meant to do because we're not free. How'd I do? Five minutes? Really? Oh, wow. Usually you can't trust a pastor with that kind of thing. They say, I'm going to end in a, in a minute, and then you, you miss lunch. But <laughs> Good, okay. Why do I bring this up? Because this fascinating thing happens in the New Testament. Uh, th this... This thing, exile, this low point in the history of Israel, this stat, this, 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 for so long the goal was we need to get free. We need to rule ourselves again. We need to get rid of these Romans. But somewhere between this Old Testament and the New Testament, something changes when we read the followers of Jesus. The status of exile, this great tragedy begins to be turned on its head. I'm going to show you what I mean by, by looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, which is on page 994 in your pew Bibles, if you want to look it up. And we're going to kind of park here for a little bit. 994, uh, 1 Peter 2. If we look at the beginning, the apostle Peter is writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion, is what he says. So these were Jewish Christian people who, you know, had been scattered to the winds, right? Jerusalem had been, had been attacked, the temple had been destroyed, and they were, they were scattered everywhere. And these were believers in Christ in the Middle East, in, in Asia Minor. Elsewhere, he calls them temporary residents, exiles. That's who these people are. And starting in verse 9 of chapter 2, we read this. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. 
As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. This is fascinating. This is really fascinating. So he's talking to these exiles. He's talking to these people who have been scattered to the wind, who have lost everything, lost their homes, lost their temple, lost everything that made them who they are. He's talking to them, and they're thinking in their minds, what did we do? God, where is God in this? And he says, you are a chosen people. Don't get it twisted. Even though this has happened to you, even though you're in exile, you are God's people. Earlier he said, God is building you into a spiritual temple to replace the physical temple that you have lost. Even though you've been cast out from the land, God is making his dwelling in your midst. That would have been unfathomable. God dwells in Jerusalem, in Israel. And he says, no, I am with you. Don't misinterpret these circumstances as a sign of my displeasure, as a sign that I have abandoned you. I am with you. Exile is no longer a sign of God's displeasure. It's become a part of his plan for them. He calls them royal priests, a holy nation, God's own possession. In Israel, all the tribes had an allotment of land. They had their plot of land in the country, except for the priests. Multiple times in the Old Testament it says, they will not have a land because I, the Lord, am their possession. And here he's reaffirming that to them. He says, you know, the Lord himself is their special possession, just as he promised them, is what Deuteronomy 8 tells us. And he's saying, and you are mine. You are my people. In a variety of ways in this passage, Peter is affirming to the exiles that their status as exile is not a bad thing. God has used it for the sake of God's mission. Look at what Peter commissions them to do in verse 12. He says, Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Does that sound familiar? I hope so, because that's the mission that he gave to Abraham all those years ago, right? That they will be blessed through you, that they will come to know me through you live a blameless life, or try your very best amongst your neighbors so that they take notice and turn to God and worship him and trust him for salvation. So sometime between the time of Israel and the time of the apostle Peter writing this letter, there was an attitude shift that happened. Something changed. For so long, they had gotten their mission confused. They had assumed that, 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 they, that once they settled in the land, that the point of their being in Canaan was to enjoy being in Canaan, to possess the land full stop. They were simply there to be the recipients of God's blessing, not blessed to be a blessing. That's a big distinction. And then Jesus comes and says, what? Blessed are you when you're persecuted, when you're poor, when you're meek, when you're hated by the world. Blessed are you when you are exiled when you are cast out of your homes and scattered to the wind, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of God. Jesus is bringing the early church back to their mission, reminding them why he had established a people for his name in the first place. They are not in the middle of the nations. They are not placed there for their comfort. They are put there with a purpose. beyond simply attaining luxury and wealth and stability and security and comfort for themselves, which they had for a time. This attitude apparently caught on from Jesus' teaching to his followers. Peter, if you read him in the Gospels, has changed a lot by the time he writes this letter. This is Peter who rebuked Jesus for suggesting he had to die, who with all the other disciples just like wanted to scrap it all, give up because Jesus died and didn't overthrow the Romans. This was his mindset. Peter has a total attitude shift. In his mind now, it's no longer a shameful tragedy that the Jews don't possess the Holy Land. It's not a tragedy. It's an opportunity. God didn't scatter us to the wind as punishment. We're scattered to the wind, and God is using that to reach everyone everywhere. Everywhere. 
The authors of the New Testament consistently lift up this new attitude. In, in Hebrews, those of faith in the Old Testament who followed God are described like this. It says they agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Being exiles, foreigners, nomads, not having a city of your own is not a tragedy. It's an opportunity to embrace a better life, to live into God's purpose for them. It's not a tragedy. It's an opportunity. Which begs the question, and here we finally turn from the text to us. Do we have this attitude? Are we looking for a better place? Are we longing for a heavenly homeland? Do we long to see Jesus return and and see his reign made visible on earth? To see every knee bowed, every tongue confessed? Do we long long to see all the wrongs made right and all the tears dried? Do we long for that? Or do we kind of hope that Jesus takes his time? Because I haven't finished Friday Night Lights yet. (laughs) I'm only in season two, Jesus. Give me like three more weeks, (laughs) please. (laughs) Please. Do we hope he takes his time? I I do, a lot, most of of the time. The unique and in some ways, you know, unfortunate situation we find ourselves in is the church in America is we are very seldom made to feel like exiles. We are very seldomly, like, made uncomfortable, really, in, in, like, substantive ways, right? It's happening more and more to us as a country, and maybe in light of this, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, because it's so easy for us to be comfortable Here's a quick science lesson, and this is like just a bad idea because this was my worst subject in school, Um, so y'all can correct me afterwards. Quick science lesson, thanks to uh, my administrative assistant, Google, that helped me out this week. Um, (laughs) There's this thing called inertia, right? This is a physics term, I think. And so inertia, I just shouldn't even be doing this. (laughs) I'm so insecure. Inertia is a property of matter by which It continues in its existing state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless that state is changed by an external force. And there's, you could say it easier than that. You could say inertia is just like a thing's tendency to just like go in a straight line, take the path of least resistance, a thing's tendency to just like come to rest. It's kind of like gravity, right? Wrong? I don't know. Tell me after. I'm trying my best. (laughs) Dave Wenger's shaking his head. You're good at science. I didn't know that. Not that I, I mean, yeah. (laughs) Humans are not exempt to this property. Humans are not exempt to this this inertia. In fact, if, if, if what we've seen in the Old Testament is true, we are ruled by this. We very easily slip into this state of rest. We very, very easily, very naturally take the path of least resistance. That's who we are. Without this external force applied to us, we're just going to keep chugging along in our little straight line. That's a good illustration. I don't care what you think. <laughs> that is who we are. We are naturally complacent. That's the sermon title. Thus, make yourself uncomfortable. This is poignant because for a lot of us, if we're going to experience real discomfort or suffering for the sake of the gospel, we're going to have to go out of our way to do it to ourselves <laughs> a lot of the time especially as we embrace Jesus' mission for us to go home, to stay home, to focus here. we got to be really careful that this inertia doesn't set in. we got to fight against that. we got to swim upstream because we're not in exile. We're not. We're comfortable. We're here. We're rooted. We're home. And for the most part, we feel at home. And if we don't feel at home right now, this morning, we're probably doing everything we can to get to a point where we do. I know I am. So we as the church need some external force applied to us. We need to be knocked on our butts a little bit. Because the church has always flourished in the midst of hardship and always floundered in peacetime, in comfort. Always, every time. This morning in Counter Church, we can't afford to let that happen. We can't. The stakes are too high. There is a dying world out there that needs us. 
There are people in here this morning that need us to not be comfortable. For their sake, we who call ourselves followers of Jesus who have been saved and found fullness of life in him, we cannot afford to be complacent. So if we're going to stay home, if we're going to undertake to be on mission here and and undergo the risk of complacency, we've got to stay alert. We've got to We've got to stay awake. And to that end, I've got to clear something up. We shouldn't even be saying the church should go on mission. The church doesn't go on mission. The church is the mission. Let me repeat that. We don't don't go on mission. The church is the mission. What do I mean? I mean that, that for us, as a group of people who, who, who most of us are followers of Jesus, Mission is not an extracurricular activity. It's not an add-on to everything else the church does. Jesus didn't institute his church on earth and say, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Palmyra, if you get around to it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, unless you know there's too much on the calendar already, and then maybe you can do it in, in September. Missions is not an extracurricular. It's not something we we just decide to undertake or not. We are the mission. We are God's instrument of mission in our communities. We just are. We are either submitting to God, letting him use us to seek and save the lost, to call all people to, to be fully devoted followers of Christ. We're either doing that or we're not a real church. We're just like a weird country club with no golf course. We could get a golf course, I guess. That would help. It's not church plus plus mission. It's church equals mission. We are God's primary instrument of mission in the world. Us. (laughs) That's kind of crazy. I mean, look around right now. Just seriously, turn your head to the left and to the right for a second. Do it. Those people are God's plan A in the world. (laughs) That's scary. Right? What is he thinking? I think that often. (laughs) Encounter Church is God's mission to the world, his instrument of carrying out his mission. Gravel Hill is God's mission. Trinity, Palm Lutheran, LCBC, Hershey Free, whoever it is, provided we are receiving and living out God's commission to us, then we are the church. We're it. God's spirit through us, that's plan A. Crazy. So it's, it's not church going on mission. It's church as mission. And if you think about it, it couldn't be any other way. If, if God's spirit is with us, if that's who we are, if we are a group of people formed and brought together by the spirit of God at work in the world, the Bible tells us that, that God is always working. Jesus is always on mission, always leaving the 99 and going after the one, always. And it is his spirit that lives in us, that moves in this place. If we are the body of Christ, his hands and feet carrying out his mission, if that's who we are, we have no choice. It's just, it's just who we are. It is part of what it means to be church. So when exile comes our way, when, when, when unfortunate circumstances happen to us or discomfort happens to us, it is not an interruption to an otherwise comfy life. It's a wake-up call, a reminder to refocus on who we are and why we're here. Sometime in May, shortly after we had moved here from New Jersey, I ran into a member of this church who lives across the street from me. And I guess I hadn't, I thought I had met his wife before. Uh, I guess I hadn't, because he... Um, he introduced me to his wife, and he introduced me as that guy that does announcements at Encounter and makes us feel guilty about Impact Palmyra. <laughs> That's literally like word for word how he introduced me. First of all, ouch. Pastors have feelings too, people. Secondly, that wasn't guilt. That was the Holy Spirit pricking your conscience. <laughs> Third... <laughs> Seriously, I was like, oh my goodness. Welcome, welcome to Palmyra, Ryan. 
Third, I'm not here to make anyone feel guilty. I'm not here to overload anyone. I'm not here to make you feel busy. And I know I've been up here pounding the pavement since April telling you about Impact Palmyra, but I am not here to make you feel guilty or overburdened. And if you're getting that from me or anyone on the staff, then I apologize and we need to do better because that's not what I'm in the business of doing. But (laughs) uh, I will continue to unashamedly call you to be who you are if Tom Fenstermacher says amen, you know it's true. I will continue to unashamedly call us to be who we are because mission for us is not optional. If we are the church, we don't have any other choice. It's who we are. And that's why we take that call so seriously. That's why we want to keep pushing. That's why we do things like Impact Palmyra, to live out that purpose, to bring glory to God by serving our neighbors. And Lord willing, we'll continue to push, continue to find ways to be faithful to what God has for us, to fight the inertia, to fight complacency, to figure out why Encounter Church is here. Why are we here? We're going to answer that question together as we we go out from here, hopefully, in the weeks and years and decades to come. So that's us. What about you? Last week, your major next step was to identify and take your baby steps. This week, your commission is is the same. I didn't have time to come up with new next steps, so I apologize. (laughs) No, no, but seriously, if we are going to be faithfully carrying out God's mission in the world, if we are going to faithfully be God's mission in the world, then you need to continue to be faithful in the small things. That's where it starts. It doesn't start with us like becoming a, a, like a nonprofit organization and doing all these things and hiring these people and doing like, all this craziness and Impact Palmyra exploding and you know, becoming Impact Pennsylvania or whatever. That's not, <laughs> it starts with you faithfully taking your baby steps in your kitchen this week. If we are going to bear witness to God's presence and power in a world that's going to hell, then you have to continue to take those steps of discipleship seriously. If we are going to be the church for our community, then then you, how you live your life matters. So keep taking your baby steps. doesn't matter how small. Just go forward. Because in discipleship, if we're not going forward, we're going backward. So just go forward. I don't care if it's an inch. Just go forward. Keep taking them. And keep taking these baby steps. And eventually you're going to hit one that's uncomfortable or hard. And when that happens... I just want you to press in and praise God. Praise God for leading you out of comfort and into the exciting, fulfilling, joyful life he has for you. Can you do that for me the next time this happens? The next time you're baby stepping along the life of discipleship and you're like, oh, I don't know about that one. Can you say, thanks, God. Thanks for wanting to use me. Thanks for loving me enough to call me to this. Don't immediately jump to alleviating the discomfort. Don't buy into the lie or the confusion that we're simply here to be blessed. Remind yourself that we are blessed to be a blessing, and then maybe you need to step in a little more. Maybe you need to lean into that. See where God takes you. Because Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is found in persecution, in suffering, in meekness, and it advances through his people being faithful in uncomfortable circumstances through something as simple and silly as baby steps, could we as Encounter Church become people that are increasingly comfortable with discomfort? In a world that sells out for luxury, security, comfort, can we, through small steps of faithfulness, become people who put it all on the line for others for the sake of a dying world? And now, don't get me wrong, this, this is one of the most loving, serving, generous groups of people I've ever been a part of. I can count on two or three hands the amount of people that took off work for a week to help with Impact Palmyra, and that boggles my mind. I will never get over that. When I'm 85, I'll be telling people over and over, you know what my church did once? But we can't settle. We're not done. We need to continue to press into the mission that we are because it's too important not to. And by the grace of God, he will create this attitude shift in us. By the grace of God, he will create a paradigm shift in us. 
Maybe that'll be through Impact Palmyra. Maybe he'll use this one small week to galvanize us in the lives of selfless, willing discomfort. Maybe you use something else. Whatever it is, whatever it is for you, for us, I, I pray that God would radically change us as only he can. That he would continue to transform us into a people, a real church that lives like we're not at home. I pray that God meddles in our lives a little bit. I pray he does something to wake each of us up. And when he does, feel free to send your complaint emails directly to me. My email's on the back of the bulletin. No, I, I would really love to hear how God is, is meddling, calling you out of yourself, calling you out of your home. At the end of the day, we need God to move in this place in our hearts. At the end of the day, it is his mission. This one mission that we've talked about all summer is God's mission. And it starts with the movement of his spirit. So at the end of the day, I can give you all the next steps in the world, but the big next step is God's. And I pray this morning that he would do that in each of us and in this place. He's faithful to do it. What we've seen throughout the Bible is God will do a whole lot of things to keep his people out of, out of comfort, to keep his people on task. And I pray that it will be faithful to do that in us. I'm going to close this morning um, by doing uh, commissioning. So last week I said that we're sent here. We have been commissioned to Palmyra. And we did a commissioning for West Virginia. And we did a commissioning for Guatemala. And so we're going to do a commissioning for Impact Palmyra. So if you are involved in Impact Palmyra in any way, if you're serving in any way, if you donated uh, anything, whatever it may be, would you be willing to stand right now? That's awesome. Now I'm going to pray for you all in a minute. I just want to acknowledge y'all and thank y'all. And there's some of you that, that, are, that are, all of you that, uh, it boggles my mind that this church is so faithful to the call God has for them. But God's commission to us, God's mission to us uh, is just starting <laughs> this week. It's been going on, and this, this is a little jump-off point. This is a little galvanizing thing. But all of us who are followers of Jesus are called to this same commission to our communities. So I would invite the rest of y'all to stand with us as well, please. And commission all of us. Because some of us just couldn't be involved with Impact Palmyra. Whatever it may be, I don't know. It's fine. But God has us all here for a reason. And we want to be faithful to that. So let me commission us this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we are humbled. We are humbled that you would even consider using us. We are we are, a, we are a messy, imperfect, flawed group of people. And it's only by your spirit that, that we're qualified and called to do anything in your name. And we just praise you. We are so humbled. So send us out, Lord. Send us out in your spirit. Lead us in your wisdom. Give us eyes for your community. Give us your eyes to see the places we walk every day, to see our workplaces, to see our living rooms and our kitchens the way you see them, that, that fields ripe for the harvest. There's so much you want to do here. And we just humbly pray that you would use us in whatever small ways you see fit this week. We pray that our community above all sees and knows your love for them. I pray that this week would not bring any glory to encounter church, 
to individual people in this room, but that they would bring glory to your name. It is in that name that we pray.